Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here in my home office with my partner in crime and co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. And just want to remind everyone before we get started, please subscribe to our podcast. We have a video channel on YouTube. We also have an audio version that you can find on Spotify, Google, Apple, etc. And I also want to mention to our audience, if you primarily consume our video channel on YouTube, just know that we have other audio episodes that were never put up on, on the video channel, and you, you may find those interesting. So we've been starting to do that. There's been some confusion. We, we post some of our audio versions on YouTube and, and people talk about, um, you know, George Young. How could you interview George Young? <laughs> from the grave. <laughs> from the grave. We had a seance. So some of those episodes are a little bit older. That's why if, if there's some confusion. Um, but then also, if you primarily consume the audio podcast, please note that we have video exclusives on the YouTube channel, especially Bernie's Quick Hitters. Uh, most of those we do not put on the audio channel, so you don't want to miss those. So uh, please, you know, consider going back and forth between audio and video if you want to consume all the content. So anyhow, uh, and follow us on social media, please. Uh, Instagram, um, Twitter, Facebook, etc. And uh, we're pretty excited about today's episode. We've been talking about this, teasing us for a long time. You can tell by my uh, T-shirt that I'm ready to go, NWO. For life. So this is our finally we're going to do our uh, wrestling <laughs> episode where we talk about some crossover issues between the world of professional wrestling and and organized crime. And I think at the heart of this episode is going to be Dino Bravo. Yep. So um, before we get into to all that, Scott, you want to talk about maybe just sort of like your contemporary reporting, how this kind of stimulated yeah. this this idea of like, oh, let's finally do this Dino Bravo wrestling organized crime episode so uh, we're going to be all over the map in this episode we're going to be uh multiple countries multiple eras um we're going to obviously talk a lot about our early childhood love of professional wrestling and what was the wwf which is now the wwe but uh for people that have been paying attention to the podcast and to gangster report and to the quick hitters know that we've been given a lot of coverage to what's going on in buffalo right now with a uh racketeering trial about to start it was supposed to start in october it was actually supposed to start back in the summer then it got moved to october now it looks like it's going to be uh early 2024 major racketeering drug sex trafficking case against the nephew of the reputed Buffalo Mafia Don uh, Joe Todaro, Big Joe, his nephew, uh, Peter Geraci Jr., owner of Pharaoh's Strip Club in uh, Cheektowaga, suburb of Buffalo. Um, and this is really the culmination of a full court press by, by federal investigators these last five, six years uh, going after Joe Todaro's network. Um, and again, I want to clarify and make sure that everybody understands that big Joe Todaro uh, does not have a federal criminal record. He is a multimillionaire by legitimate means uh, by his ownership of the Lenovo pizza and wing franchise. And he's a very prominent businessman in Western New York, but dating back to when he was in his twenties, uh, federal investigators, have believed that he is a first, they believed he was a member of organized crime in the, uh, the Magadino crime family. They believe in the 1980s, he became underboss. Uh, and then at some point in the two thousands, he became boss. According to the federal government, he denies any involvement in mob affairs. What we know for sure is that his nephews have gotten caught up. Um, Peter Geraci and his brother, Anthony Geraci both got uh, nailed in federal drug cases. Peter's case is about to go to trial, as we said, and at least two people with direct connections to the case have died under suspicious circumstances over the last 18 months. Three people uh, with a connection. The third person has a loose tangential connection. Uh, two of the people have direct connections. 
I know this is a this is a long explanation to, to eventually to it does, it does figure out back. how we got to <laughs> Dino Bravo, but I just want to make sure everybody understands yeah. uh, where this is coming from. So uh, the star witness, who uh, uh, a stripper at the club who was going to be the star witness in this case, died in August. The FBI is investigating uh, foul play, and my reporting has been able to illuminate the fact that she was not just close with Peter Geraci Jr., uh, was alleged to have acted as his personal assistant and uh, sometimes maid. She also worked at the club, but that she was hanging around with reputed associates, possibly members of the Buffalo Mafia. And the people that she was hanging around with before she died were involved heavily in cigarette smuggling and rackets being run on Indian reservations uh, in upstate New York. This brought us to Dino Bravo. Uh, Dino Bravo uh, was murdered 30 years ago. Um, if you're our age, if you're in your 40s and you followed wrestling in the 80s, you remember Dino Bravo. You know, he wasn't a superstar, but he definitely was a star. In Canada, he was a superstar. And uh, his murder in 1993 uh, was tied to mob activity in Canada, potentially mob activity in Buffalo. Some Hells Angels were playing a role in, in this narrative as well. And I didn't really know much about the cigarette smuggling uh, racket in, you know, the, the, this pipeline that was going in between Canada and America. And I, I've learned that it, it's a, a, Big money maker out there in, in Western New York, in upstate New York, and has been for decades. And um, Dino Bravo was kind of smack in the middle of it. So, you know, we're going to kind of go backwards and then maybe you know, call her up with, with some stuff that's going on now. But I think the, the majority of this episode will be about what was going on in, in the eighties and nineties with the cigarette smuggling and how Dino Bravo uh, got involved in it. And then eventually ended up dead in a gangland slain. Yeah. So let's, let's rewind here and, and talk about Dino Bravo as, as the wrestler, first of all, because otherwise the, the fact that he was killed in 93 mafia associate, people might think, okay, well, you know, why is that so interesting? Well, the fact, because he was a well-known professional wrestler, um, he starts off, um, He's an uh, an Italian Canadian, and he starts off as a wrestler in the international wrestling territory, which is out of uh, Montreal. And uh, you know now, young people who watch wrestling, you know WWE pretty much controls everything. There's still a few independents. I think what is it? Um, AEW, I think is is one of the. I don't I don't watch wrestling. E yet, I think ECW. Watch. There's an extreme something. Yeah, that, that's yeah, independent. I think, I think that's I think that's out of. Um, I'm not sure if that still exists, but um, but back in the day when Scott and I were kids, there were multiple territories and uh, like WWF back then, which was WWE now, was considered like a Northeast territory. You had Mid-South, NWA was um, considered like Georgia um, and AWA and was yeah, in Minnesota, it was Minnesota. So um, international wrestling was the Canadian territory and Dino Bravo was a, a big uh, superstar there. And he was wrestling in the WWF. Um, and I remember as a kid that he was booked as the Canadian heavyweight champion, but he didn't really generate a lot of heat. And so he, he decided to spend most of his time in back in the Canadian territory. And this was around the time, I guess, 86, 87, when McMahon really started to just monopolize everything and sort of he started raiding those territories, bringing all the talent from those independent territories to his company. Consolidated. And, um, yeah. And so he did that with Canada, too. And he he signed the Rougeau brothers or the Rougeau brothers, uh, Rick Martel, Dino Bravo. If you're a wrestling fan, you, you remember those names. And I can and remember as a kid in Detroit watching cbc and watching the canadian wrestling channel or this the show wrestling show and so when when mcmahon signed those guys the rougeau brothers dino bravo i already knew who they were from from watching the independent uh shows yeah not to digress too much but also you know some or 
at least one iconic WW effort that came from Canada that we haven't mentioned yet is uh, Stampede Wrestling, which was out of Calgary. Yeah. Uh, which was uh, the, the Hart family. Oh, yeah. And, right. you know, Brett the Hitman yeah. Hart's dad, I believe, uh, was the guy that was the promoter in that part Too of Canada. Hard, yeah. uh, and, and then, you know, Brett Hitman Hart became, you know, the new Hulk Hogan kind of uh, after Hulk Hogan left uh, WWE uh, for, for uh, WCW or NWA, yeah, he, whatever it was at yeah, the time. He, it was WCW. Yeah. Yeah. And, the Hart's uh, the first, the first family of wrestling. Yep. So, I mean, the, there's always been this, you know, uh, interwoven fabric between American wrestling and Canadian wrestling and Dino Bravo was, you know, at the, you know, really at the epicenter of it when wrestling was becoming huge. I mean, I can, I can remember uh, the, the, the difference between wrestling when I first got into it in the early to mid eighties to what it was by the end of that decade. I mean, it mm -hmm. grew leaps and bounds throughout the 1980s to become way more mainstream than it ever had been before. Yeah. So not only was it more well-known, uh, you know, whether you watched wrestling or not, you knew about it and the production value went up. And so, right. It, I, I agree with you. It was, it was pretty fun to watch it develop and evolve in, in real the time. The crossover with MTV was a real big deal at the oh, time. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the rock and wrestling era, which was. Yeah. And, and, and then there was a cartoon like McMahon was the first to understand marketing. Right. He they had a wrestling cartoon. They knew because up until that point, wrestling was considered like an adult. It was, kind ni of it was niche. It was a niche was sport. Niche. But McMahon realized there were kids like Scott and I. Who, and, and he was the one who was like, oh, let's have a cartoon. Let's have action figures. Let's have whatever. Let's have ice cream bars and cream vitamins bar. and, and it was smart. It granola worked. bars and snacks. Yeah. Yeah, they got a whole generation of, of I mean Hulk Hogan, bugs. but by 86, 87, 88, outside of you know, Dwight Doc Gooden and Magic and Larry Bird and Michael Jordan, uh Joe Montana and, and John Elway. I mean, Hulk Hogan was right in that orbit that's totally. how big hulk hogan had reached by the the late 80s totally. i mean it was controversial because he made the cover of sports illustrated and a lot of people took exception to that because wrestling is not spoiler it's not real but at that <laughs> but at that at that point there there wasn't the full acknowledgement of that that's it wasn't right. until yeah. the late 90s Mark where they yeah <laughs> Right. So, I mean, these guys are, are athletes and put themselves, you know, in, in harm's way. I don't want to. But but when, so when I say fake, I mean, chore, choreographed is, is what we mean. But so there were some people that took exception to Hogan being on the cover of, of, of Sports Illustrated. So, yeah, there's no question that that Hogan was huge. And so a guy like Dino Bravo has a choice in the mid 80s. He could take more money and go to WWF. But he's going to be a mid Carter. And he's going to be a heel, which means he's going to be a bad guy. Or he can stay in Canada where he can call the shots and he can be a champion and a superstar, but he's a big fish in a small pond and he ain't going to make the same kind of money. And this was a tough decision for him because I believe he was part owner of international wrestling and he was a booker. He was like the promoter. So this was not an easy decision for him, but everyone was joining. That, that's where the money was. The Rougeau brothers, Rick Martel, all these Canadian guys, the hearts all went to uh, McMahon and WWF. And so Bravo does the same thing. And uh, it was, it was a tough uh, decision for him, not finan financially. It was a good decision, but, but he wasn't, he wasn't the the big man on campus anymore. Well, right? And I believe it, he had two stints in, in WWF. Yeah, yeah he did. He had a, his yeah. first stint in the late seventies, early eighties, I believe he won the tag team championship belt. He may have. Uh, that's a good question. I, I, don't I believe remember. in the in the late 70s. I think he was a WWF tag team champion for a second. But then, by, like to your point, then by the, the late 80s, he returns. He's changed some of his image. You could see in the picture we flashed. He had he dyed his hair blonde. Right. Um, and became a heel and yeah. became like part of Bobby Heenan or Jimmy. I think it was uh, Jimmy Hart. Jimmy Hart. Uh, I think he he was managed by both those guys who were kind of bad guy. Yeah, it started off uh, Johnny Luscious Johnny v. Johnny Luscious B. Yeah, right <laughs> at the at the very beginning, and then Frenchie Martin was his manager. Yeah. He, had, he had quite a few. He was in quite a few stables. Uh, but let's okay. people let, let's now let's people now let's let people understand what his 
background was outside of Russell. Yeah. So his, his real name is, I mean, it's um, he, he was Italian, Italian uh, Canadian guy. And I think his uh, last name is uh, Bresciano. Adolfo um, Bresciano. Right. And so he is, uh, he happens to be related to a very prominent organized crime family in Montreal, which is the Catroni family. So we've, we've been geeking out on wrestling. If you don't follow wrestling, but you listen to our podcast regularly, you probably recognize the Catroni name. Uh, that is a very uh, like mafia royalty in, in, in Montreal. Saying in Montreal, saying Catroni is like saying Gambino or Genovese in New York. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't know any of this when we were kids watching. No. Dino Bravo. Really? No Why idea. would we? Why would we? I had no idea that his uncle was Vic Catroni, who was, for all intent and purpose, the mafia boss of Montreal. And I think it's important to get into the weeds here and point out that I say for all intent and purpose because that was not his official rank. Uh, At that point, Montreal was part of the... Bonanno crime family out of New York. And um, initially, Catroni was like the shot caller, but then Joe Bonanno dispatches Carmine, uh, uh, Carmen Galante in the, in the 1950s to basically colonize Montreal. Do you think that's a, a, an accurate description? Yes. And <laughs> the, the, the process is making contact with, with Vic Catroni. His real name was Vincent, but he went by uh, Vic. Vic. Or was it Vittorio? No, it's Vincenzo. Vincenzo uh, went by Vic. He was actually a professional wrestler. Yeah, that's right. In his <laughs> earlier days, went by Vic Vincent, I believe. Um, they His nickname in the underworld was The Egg. No one yeah. really knows exactly where that came from. But uh, Vic Catroni was a big part of this Bonanno Great White North expansion it was go to Montreal, plant a flag, and get Vic Catroni and all his guys to come underneath your umbrella. And that's what Galante did. And for a couple of years there, Galante was living in Montreal. Yes. And he, you know, they were they were each other's shadows. You couldn't see Galante without seeing Catroni. You couldn't see Catroni without seeing Galante. Yeah, my understanding is that it was a pretty peaceful, amicable merger. Um, this was uh maybe a parallel to our Westies episode the other day with Jimmy Coon and, and the Gambinos. I don't I don't think Catroni was there was any resistance. I think he recognized he liked it. I think he liked this was it. A big opportunity for them. It was right. Joe Bonanno, who was one of the original New York Godfathers, coming yes. and stamping a uh you know authenticity factor there, or uh uh this guy's for real. He's not right. just a he's not just a big deal in Canada, he works for us. Right. So I, I think th- there wasn't a lot of resistance there. So and, and I think he embraced it. So he becomes his official title is is a capo di Cina. He's, he's a captain. And but, you know, keep in mind, Montreal, there's some distance between Montreal and New York. So I think when we say all intent and purpose, crime boss, um, he had more juice than your average captain, I would say, in the Bananos, because, you know, he he's he left alone for the most part, unlike unlike some of the other captains who are, you know, directly under the thumb of the yeah. administration in, in, in New York. In, in terms of personality, it, you know, you research him. He was known as a pretty vicious guy that, that enjoyed violence. Um, wasn't someone that used violence, de- you know, uh, deliberately or cautiously, you know, it was the answer to anything and everything. Um. He was somebody that he was feared, definitely feared. Yeah, and I, I, uh, I caught a, a wiretap of him when I was doing my research, and I thought this little anecdote kind of sums him up. Uh, there was a, this actually it was a case that made it to to court in Toronto, where there was a shakedown of a stockbroker, a Jewish stockbroker in, in uh, Toronto in the seventies, and uh, Johnny Papalia, Johnny Pops, who was the Buffalo mobs. Canadian capo. Um, he was shaking down the stockbroker using Vic Catroni's name. Uh, I think he he got about a half a mil from him, maybe more. Uh, I could be messing up the numbers. It could have been, I, I, as I'm thinking about, it, I think it was more. I think it was more of like a couple million, but whatever it was, 
he didn't share it with Catroni and didn't tell Catroni he was using his name. And they wired up a a, a restaurant where they met. And uh, Papalia, who was a pretty formidable mm-hmm. force of of criminality in his own right, is not someone who backed down or 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 um you know, uh, turtled in front of powerful people. He was a powerful person himself. You know, he, he makes a, a comment to Vic Catroni, like, listen, I'm being honest with you. I'm not lying to you. He's trying to explain why Catroni didn't realize that what Papaya was doing was on the up and up. And, and, and Catroni kind of sits back in, in his chair and, and gives like a chuckle. He's like, yeah, I know you're not lying because if I find out that you're lying, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you where you stand. Yeah. And Another mean guy. A, yeah. And this was just kind of like matter of factly. And he's saying this to a guy, a guy who was a killer. Johnny pops was a killer. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, Johnny pops, reaction was then to kind of go into, I, I didn't mean to offend you, Vic. He, he's not pushing back on it or, or getting mad at the threat. He's trying to calm Vic Catroni down. Yeah. And this was yeah. Dino Bravo's uncle. This was his dad's sister's husband. Yeah. So he's um, he, he's and he's well known people in Montreal. He's sort of like the John Gotti or El Capone of, you know, for, for the average person. And he has great. And he had two brothers that were pretty active. Uh, Frank, Big Frank and then uh, Joe Pep. Uh, who were his younger brothers, and and they were uh, very active and 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 prominent as well. And one thing, if if uh, Benny, if you want to put up the 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 graph of the um, yeah the family tree there, I think this is kind of interesting too because um, our audience will find it interesting. So you see Catroni there at the top. There's also this like ethnic dispute, and uh, one thing that Galante and Joe Bonanno were able to do is get the Calabrese and the and the Sicilians to play nice with each other. So if you look at that chart there, you'll see some Calabrians like Catroni, Violi, um, and the, some of these names are going to come up again when we talk about what's going on now. Um, and then you'll also see some Sicilian names in there like uh, Rizzuto, which is, again, very, very prominent name right now. Uh, you'll see um, Shasha there, uh, George from Canada. And shameless self-promotion, if you listen to our episode with Richie Cantarella, he and Scott actually talk about the murder of, of George from Canada. So these Sicilians and Calabrians uh, don't necessarily get along, but Galante and Bonanno are able to get them to to play nice with each other. But those um, tensions still still exist and they're they're going to, you know, I think, surface again uh, in the 70s and then and then more more recently. So it's it's just a complicated political environment there but I, you know i don't think dino bravo necessarily has anything to, to do with it at that level but it just kind of paints a picture of what was going on politically he, in there when he was wrestling he was moonlighting as like yeah. a bodyguard for some of the uh, some of his cousins yeah that and were, debt collector that, yeah that were uh, vic catroni's nephews um and then you know would i think he dabbled a little bit uh Vic Catroni dies in 84. He had been removed from a lot of the day to day for about 15 years. I think he had handed it over to Paolo Violi, uh, who became kind of the street boss. Violi is in a huge feud with the Rizzutos. Um, We know that Catroni at a point early in Violi's reign as street boss, they're aware of the danger that the Rizzutos pose. Uh, I believe the Rizzutos had left town at some point in the seventies and went to Venezuela. Yeah, Nicolo Rizzuto did. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He goes but, to South America. But, uh, cause he, cause he thinks it's a very real possibility. They're going to kill him. Right. Which is, which is what I'm about to say. They have all these wires from 72, 73, 74 with Vic Catroni trying to recruit, uh, hitters. Some of them from New York to come and kill, uh, Nick Rizzuto. Um, eventually the Rizzutos win the battle of power and Paolo Violi and a couple of his brothers are murdered in the late seventies. Uh, these are, these are actually the Violi brothers that we're going to talk about, um, later on in the episode. Those are the sons. Yeah. It's okay. No worries. Um, but yeah, those are Paolo Violi's sons who will pop up 
later in the episode. Yeah. But uh, it doesn't look like Vic Catroni would have signed off on no. Paulo Catroni, uh, at, at, on Paulo Violi's assassination. So I think that definitely says something about where Catroni himself stood uh, in, in the mob landscape in the late 70s as he was ending out his reign. Yeah, I think there was already the the machinations were in place to to put George from Canada as like, for all intent and purpose, the real captain in Montreal. And when you say George from Canada, what that really means is the bananas. Yeah, oh, well, right. <laughs> the risottos, and then and then these are vis the bananas. Visa, right? These are the but bananas. So it's pretty clear New York signed off on on all of that. Um, and so so Catroni had, um. I think he, he had lost some some juice, but he was still a respected guy. I mean, he was still a, a made guy, and 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 um, and and so Dino Bravo is able to parlay that into some economic opportunities, as, as you point out, because you have to keep in mind, you know, in the, in the late seventies, early eighties, those guys weren't making a lot of money, um, especially in those independent territories. So if you can moonlight, you're already a wrestler. You're a big tough guy, right? You you know you can you can handle yourself. He's related to prominent underworld figures and so as scott points out he was moonlighting as a bodyguard and and debt collector and uh, making a little money on the side and that's interesting because that came out later a lot of wrestlers that he worked with didn't didn't realize that until he was killed where like he had this whole backstory like he didn't he didn't just start getting involved with this and he he had a prior history i think one of the the strands of the narrative here is that you know reading law enforcement uh, documents related to this, reading old articles that were written about this, talking to some people uh, that were, you know, involved in, in that uh, environment. Dino Bravo had expensive tastes. Yeah. This was a guy that liked living what Ric Flair would talk about in his, <laughs> in his standups about yeah. Rolls Royces and Rolex watches and yeah. beautiful women and, you know, the best nightclubs. Jet and, flying. Right. <laughs> A limousine ride. Right. So uh, Dino Bravo um, was able to live that lifestyle as a wrestler while he was moonlighting. Uh, I, I think you can kind of combine the two incomes to to live pretty high on the hog, if you will. Yeah, especially um, once he signs with WWF, then, he, right. then he's, he's finally making some real money, which I think there was a decline in like his underworld stuff because right. he, he just he didn't need he didn't need he didn't to have the time and he didn't have the time. He didn't have the time. Right. He was. That's a good point. You're touring a lot. Right? But by the late I'm 90s, sure. uh, Vince McMahon and the powers that be or, or did I say late 90s? I meant it's, it early, late, 80, 80, yeah, late early 80s, 90s. early 90s. Uh, there is a altering of opinion from the the people that are running WWF WWE of the value that Dino Bravo uh provides to the uh promotion and and because Dino Bravo was older at that point right and, and you know in that world it's you know out with the out with the old and in and, and with the new he was like I think in his 40s at that yeah point. so in 9192 he is phased out involuntarily yeah uh, by the WWE, they they cut his contract and said, we don't want to work with you anymore. Uh, and at that point, this was in 92, I believe. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, he makes the decision to dive right back into the deep end of the Canadian underworld. And he, I don't think he's. Um, I mean, I'm sure he wasn't advertising it everywhere he went, but. It, it, he didn't really have a, uh, a, a, a nine to five job at that point. I mean, he, he purchased some property and this is where we're going to get into the cigarette smuggling, uh, purchased a big piece of property in Champlain, New York. Um, and started to make connections on the Indian reservations. And this is where we're going to kind of let people know about this, this giant racket. Uh, of, of cigarette smuggling, which is so lucrative in the, in uh, that part of the world. And I want to throw it back to Jimmy. Now, one of the things that I think we both found interesting was that Dino Bravo had a pretty easy entry into this racket because 
of the Indian reservations in the area playing such a prominent role. And the, the chiefs, the, the leaders of these Indian reservations were big wrestling fans. Yeah. So yeah. when Dino Bravo comes knocking on the TP door <laughs> to, to do business, they come on in. Let's let's talk about wrestling. Let's talk about your matches with Chief Jay Strongbow and Wahoo McDaniel. And uh and, and let's talk business. Yeah, they were they were pretty psyched, pretty psyched about that, um, to, to be able to work with him. And and I also want to point out something else to, to your point about his extravagant taste. He's he's living in Laval, which is it's like the Beverly Hills of Montreal, right? Which is also very mafia <laughs> kind of mafia neighborhood. Yeah, that's where a lot of other mafia heavyweights live. So he has this really uh, like kind of ostentatious, you know, home and and lifestyle. So when he's um, unceremoniously let go from from WWF and you know he doesn't get any other contract offers from WCW at that time WCW were picking up some of the 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 guys that were let go from WWF like even like big names like Hogan Macho Man but they don't they don't make an offer to to Bravo and so he's got to figure out a way to sustain that lifestyle and so he he reconnects with some of these underworld figures and um one of um the most lucrative rackets he gets into is, is cigarette smuggling. And as Scott points out, right, the, the Indian reservation guys were really psyched to work with him and uh, because they were wrestling fans. And another thing that's interesting to note is it's not like he invented this racket. It turns out that Catroni and the guys in Western New York, the Magadino family, this is something that these guys had been involved in for a long time. So there's already kind of an infrastructure in place and then you add to the fact Bravo's charisma, celebrity status, he's able to get himself right in the middle of it. And he was really smart. He purchased that piece of property. Um, and it's, from what I could understand, it was in very close proximity to one of these Indian reservations, which was, uh, which served as the smuggling route. And that on his Champlain, New York property, he had like a packaging and repackaging like plant where a lot of the cigarettes that were um, coming from Canada into the United States and then being smuggled back into Canada. He, he was working with the Montreal group, and then he was also working with uh, a crew in the Buffalo Mafia out of Niagara Falls. Uh, who who handled at that time handled all of the uh, smuggling rackets for the Magadinos, the Nicoletti crew, Sonny Nicoletti. It's been dead for about ten years, but uh, a very um, powerful member of of the Buffalo group for years. Uh, his dad went all the way back to the original Magadino, and um, they are using the Champlain property as a um, kind of a way station, a place where a lot of the, the uh, cigarettes end up after they're smuggled into the United States and then they're brought to the property in Champlain, either repackaged or whatever has to be done with them and then put into the machine, the smuggling machine, which goes into the Indian reservations and then pops out the other end in Ontario. You start, yes. you start in New York in like Erie County, uh, and then you end up in Ontario. Yeah. So one of the things to point out here is the economics of it. So Canada at that time, and I'm maybe the, I probably, probably still do even in the United States. It's the case now really high taxes on, on cigarettes. And so um, what they would do was sneak the sm smuggle, the cigarettes into the United States. Uh, and as Scott points out, either repackage them, rebrand them or whatever, and then smuggle them back into Canada. And then a lot of times sell them on the reservations or whatever. You know, you could you could buy them. Well, I think free. I think the re uh, the res rackets were. Yes, they were a part of the of the cigarette smuggling infrastructure, but they also had you had. Yes, you had cigarettes that were being sold on the black market on the res, but the res also was acting as this conduit yeah so it wasn't like all the cigarettes were being smuggled were just ending up in the reservation no no uh, uh, that was only i think a small 
yeah, yeah, they were all over. Percentage of them. Yeah, and then there were all other, and then there are other rackets that the, at least I can speak on the Buffalo end of things, uh, for decades, the Buffalo Magadino family has been running traditional rackets on Indian reservations, which I was unaware of until some of this, but that dovetails with uh, this big surge of cigarette smuggling in the late eighties, uh, early nineties, when the taxes in Canada were going through the roof. And it was really the, probably the last point in, in at least American history where smoking was still mainstream mm-hmm. by the late nineties, it was being phased out You know, mm-hmm. by the mid two thousands. It was illegal. <laughs> I mean, to smoke in public places. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, and the taxes keep going up. Yeah. On, Let on. me just correct myself. Uh, Champlain's in Clinton County. It's not in Erie. In, it's not in Erie County. Just want to. Okay. Clear. So uh, one thing, another thing to point out here is the stakes are getting higher for a guy like Dino Bravo. So when he's younger, you know, he's, his uncle is, is a big time mafioso. So he moonlights as a debt collector, maybe a bodyguard. But now, He's he's directly involved in facilitating some pretty lucrative rackets. So the stakes are getting higher in terms of um, let's say if things go wrong, you, you you may not be able to just say who your uncle is and get and get well, and, and your uncle's away. dead at, at this point. <laughs> right, I mean, right, his yeah, that's his right. his brothers are still around, right? Uh, Frank and Joe, but but Vic is gone. But Vic is gone. Yeah. Um. I think you also have a, in terms of the the Buffalo end of this, you had a lot of protection, uh, either from law enforcement. Uh, you know, we we were discussing off air, and it's something that w- we should interject here that the tobacco companies themselves, the, the the big tobacco on Tobacco Road in in North Carolina, R. J. Reynolds, uh, William Moore, is it? Uh, What's what's the the more the Philip Morris? Yeah. I want to say William William. Uh, these are these are you know the 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 McDonald's and Burger King or the Coke and Pepsi of of that industry, and they're complicit. It comes out in in some uh, lawsuits and and criminal uh, uh, criminal investigations and trials in the nineties. It comes out that these the big tobacco is complicit in some of this smuggling. Right. And that's really interesting because especially on the, the, the Canadian side of the operation, because they realize they're losing all this money through uh, the, the, you know, the contraband cigarettes. And they decide why if, if they're going to smuggle these cigarettes anyhow, we might as well get a piece of it because there are our cigarettes <laughs> to begin with. And so they were trying to lobby the Canadian government to lower the taxes and, and the, they were unsuccessful. So they, they were like, fuck it. We're going to we're going to start working with the smugglers. To, ironically to smuggle their own cigarettes back in into canada and sell, so, sell some of these guys people. were actually like on payroll yeah yeah the mobs yeah the, the like, smugglers, well not yeah. the mob guys themselves but no, guys no, but that the, were associated to the yeah. or, who were answering to those mob guys were actually yeah. like had offices on tobacco road yeah the smugglers yeah part of that 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 network so and then that's how you get into like maybe some of the the, the protection by, by right. political people and well, Nick, because those those political people are bought and paid for by right. the tobacco industry. So back then in the 80s and 90s, the there were a pair of siblings, the Tavano brothers, who were nephews of or sorry, cousins of Sonny Nicoletti. And they were the point men for the Magadino crime family in the smuggling business. They also had uh, criminal records for gambling, bookmaking, fraud. Uh, one of the Tavanos I know moved out to Vegas when this was all going on. Bobby Tavano, who I believe is still alive, he's 80 years old right now. At one point in time, he was the head of the GOP in Niagara, <laughs> in Niagara Falls, a whole part of uh, New York's uh, a whole, you know, a little section of New York's Republican Party was in the hands of this convicted or eventually convicted mob associate. So, you know, that speaks to to uh, some of the the protection that they were afforded. But getting back to Dino Bravo, in a short period of time, this property in Champlain uh, 
becomes a beehive of activity. And from what I could gather, was very efficient and was very, um, the security was, was top rate. And word began to spread that this is a great piece of property for all kinds of smuggling, not just cigarette smuggling. Right. That's usually and, pretty common in these cases. And around the same time, when Dino Bravo was being approached by drug dealers, who want him to start smuggling cocaine for them using this Champlain property. There's also rumors, innuendo, speculation circulating through the Magadino clan, specifically the Nicoletti crew, that Dino Bravo was possibly skimming off the top from the business relationship that he has with the Indian Reservation and the Buffalo uh, organized crime group. I'm not sure where the Montreal group plays in to that allegation. Um, and also it gets pretty murky because, you know, you have politicians, you have corporations, but as you point out, you, you've got the Magadino family, possibly Montreal, but also when you look at some of that reporting, they, they said the hell's angels were, were right, so somehow he, in, in, into this network as well. Yeah. So the hell's angels played a role in it. Um, a lot of shady characters and we've talked about it on here quite a bit when it comes to the you know, reasons why people get killed in the underworld. A lot of times it's not one thing. It's a combination of several things. So nobody's ever been arrested for Dino Bravo's murder. Um, we're not positive on a motive. We have a lot of, again, speculation, but we know that something happened in the weeks leading up to Dino Bravo being killed in his own mansion in Laval by somebody that he let into the house and was most likely watching a hockey game with. Um, there was one or two seizures of contraband in Montreal in a warehouse. I believe the first seizure was cigarettes uh, and the second seizure was cocaine. And there was a lot of finger pointing on who was responsible for the RCMP uh, coming in and swooping down and, and uh, raiding, confiscating you know, those two shipments. And there's, I don't, I don't have any doubt that that played a role in Dino Bravo being killed, I don't know how much of the pie, if you're going to slice it up, um, rests with that one situation. But it it definitely proved as some type of breaking point or or you know straw that broke the camel's back because uh, within ten ten or eleven days, I believe he was he was killed. Yeah, and I want to just speak to sort of a criminological view on a couple of things you said. Um, first of all. It wouldn't be uncommon for a guy to be skimming off of <laughs> an operation, and then it just becomes a matter of how far do you push it, and then you know to to what extent are you are you held accountable for it. But another thing that's very common is something Scott mentioned, which is once you have established a, a tried and true smuggling route, it's usually not long before you start smuggling other things in addition to what you started off smuggling that's very common uh when we look at 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 the um the underworld so most of the big sicilian drug lords that we think of that emerged in the 60s 70s battlemente guys like that all those guys started out as cigarette smugglers and once you have the 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 routes in place and the infrastructure in place then it's like, well, why not smuggle heroin too? Because you well, look at pop. Look at the two biggest uh, worldwide narco czars of our lifetime, Pablo Escobar and El Chapo. Where do they get their start? It wasn't in cocaine. No, they started in marijuana. Yeah, and then right. they graduated from smuggling and selling marijuana to smuggling and selling cocaine. Yeah, because once the network's in place, uh, and so. The, there's evidence that suggests that that's what happened with with Dino Bravo, among other people, was uh, why not smuggle cocaine 
as well. And and I, I think the reason why that's significant is um traditionally not not that cigarette smuggling is is a uh, you know uh, uh something that doesn't have some kind of danger to it any kind of smuggling does but once you start talking about the the drug trade usually this the stakes go i mean guys start getting a lot more trigger happy i would say mm-hmm. when you start talking about drug smuggling well and then missing you know. drug shipments worth yes. you know hundreds of thousands of dollars if not millions of dollars yeah you know, it drug Drug activity in the underworld is economy. Yeah. <laughs> and when money uh, pops up missing or product pops up missing, it needs to be replaced. <laughs> and in order for the machine to keep on working. So um, uh, there's a lot of questions that needed to be answered after this. Dino Bravo obviously didn't have the right answers to these questions. It didn't look like he could run to his uncle's Borgata and it doesn't look like he could, he could have run to Sonny Nicoletti for, for help either. If, you know, and this is all speculation, but if the Nicoletti crew already thinks that you're skimming and the Montreal guys get mad at you for a, a, a botched cigarette or cocaine deal, you don't have the, the Nicoletti guys to come run to, to, to protect you. And your, your uncle has been dead for 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, to, to your point, there was, um, some, some finger pointing with that bot shipment. Um, the, the one side blamed, you know, Bravo and said, because they know, they know that Bravo was surveilled going to the warehouse. And so they blamed him. Like you, you were being tailed by the cops and why were you, why were you, you know, you brought heat. You brought you brought heat, whereas Dino Bravo pushed back and said, "Listen, I'm I I dropped it off and you left it there for what three four days something like that. Right. Then that that's on you if if eventually the cops uh, raid the place and confiscate the, the the contraband. So there was a lot of like finger pointing over that. And I think and I I don't want to disparage the the um, the legacy of Dino Bravo or or make unfounded accusations, but. I know because there were two raids, the one that we're talking about now about the, the, the product sitting there for four days was the cocaine. Right. But there had been another raid in that same early 93 period where they confiscated cigarettes. There started to be talk that maybe Dino had tipped off, uh, the, the law enforcement for, for some of this. Well, and another, again, we don't, we don't know if this is connected or not, but it, it certainly is in, intriguing. Another mobbed up cigarette smuggler in that same neighborhood was killed around the same time as Dino Bravo was. Yeah. So um, it, I'm not sure if it's connected, but it certainly seems suspicious and seems plausible that, that, that they were connected. So he's in the danger zone either way. So just a little bit of the forensics on, on what happened. Um, his wife leaves with the, the daughter. This is March, and, March 10th, 1993. Yeah. And they come home after midnight around 1230 and they discover his body. As Scott points out, no forced entry. All evidence suggests that he knew the assailant or assailants and let them in. In fact, he, there's no like defensive posture he, he doesn't seem to have any defensive. He pocket. was shot from behind. Yeah. And, but he, he was seemed, shot in the back of the head. But he seemed to like, he was sort of lounging. Yeah. Well, he, the they chair. were, they were, they were watching a hockey game. Yeah. So he, he almost certainly knew, not only knew these people, but felt comfortable with them. And that, I think that's important because if you watch the dark side of the ring episode, which, which I highly recommend, and they interview some of his colleagues, Apparently, Dino Bravo was saying to some people that he may have gotten in over his head and he was fearful that that there could be some kind of retribution. And so there's some evidence that he was on guard, but clearly not that night, not in that situation. So he trusted and he trusted the people he let into his house to watch the game with. Yeah. So so in that specific case, this must have been someone he was very comfortable with uh, to let his let his guard down. Like that. I think the, I read a, a story where the police were speculating that him and the killer or killers were on a, a couch uh, watching the game. He might have been in a recliner. Yeah, I think he and was. the killer or killers got up 
feigning that they were going to go get something in the kitchen and came up behind him and, and blasted him. Uh, he didn't, he never saw it coming basically. No. And he was shot. It was pretty brutal. He was shot 11 times. I think seven and took seven shots to the face and I think four to the body or, or, or vice versa. I can't remember the, the forensics of it, but the reason why I'm saying assailant or assailants is in all likelihood, it seems like it was two assailants. There were, there were two weapons found. However, there is one theory out there that that was by design to, to throw off investigators that it was it was one person. So we, we don't we don't know for sure, but um, it, it could be it could be either way. So it's a pretty, pretty brutal gangland slaying in a, in a pretty affluent neighborhood. Right. Yeah. Um, so and he's and he's you know still a celebrity, especially in that part of the continent part of north america he's still a, a pretty big celebrity so i think it was it caught a lot of people by surprise because he was such a popular beloved celebrity i, I don't think people realize how deep he had gotten himself into the underworld even if they heard rumors about his uncle or whatever that you know you, you, that's an that can be an accident of birth right you can't ch choose who your relatives are but but this was you know it became apparent to everyone that no he was he was he was neck deep in in underworld activities and i think you get perspective the further you get away from it um i think when it first happened you know you don't you can't contextualize it as much now that you're 30 years removed if you if you do a google search on it uh, a lot of stuff has been written in the last 10 to 15 years um, a lot less was written uh, right when it first happened yeah 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 for sure um so um in terms of who was who was responsible uh there's different theories um one theory is the the uh native american or native canadians on the reservation although a, a pushback to that is, yeah, they may be involved in this, but they don't have a reputation for, for that violence. kind of. And yeah, they for, liked him. And they liked him. Right. So um, then the other two or the other three culprits could be uh, outlaw bikers are, are at the top of the suspect list. Uh, the Italians, whether it was on the Montreal or the or the Buffalo side. And then the other possibility is just some kind of uh, free agent like someone else in that smuggling network that that he fucked over or they were going to fuck over him so it's still pretty murky in terms of zero uh, narrowing it down to who actually pulled this off but it was definitely a professional gangland hit it's also interesting to you know try to tie it back into what's going on today back then it looked like buffalo lcn was working shoulder to shoulder with the hell's angels in a lot of this now, 30 years later, if if you believe what's being put into uh, court documents and uh, whatnot, they're working very closely with the outlaws. Um, so, you know, different different group, possibly the same racket. Again, bringing it in today, th this this racket still exists. I don't think it's as big of a moneymaker uh, as it was back then. But guys in Buffalo, guys in. Uh, uh, Ontario and Quebec are still heavily involved in, in cigarette smuggling. Yeah. And if, um, I don't know if, uh, if Benny could put up that picture just to yeah, so wrap the it up here, the, 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 the Violi brothers who the, the, the father and the uncles were under that old Decina under Catroni. Um, remember they were on the outs with the Rizzutos. And once the Rizzutos became the hegemonic power in Montreal, the Violi brothers, and that that family left and um, sought refuge in Hamilton under under the protection of the Magadino family and also the uh, Lupino uh, uh, crime family in in Canada, who, and they're affiliated with the Buffalo the Buffalo people. And this is um, you know something we've talked about on the show, and Scott can speak to this more. But there's a lot of evidence, including including wiretaps, <laughs> that the Violi brothers are now very much active and high-ranking members of the Magadino family in, in Western yeah. New York. Uh, FBI and RCMP. And, and that part of Ontario. Yeah. FBI and RCMP identify Dom Violi, who was the guy on, on the left in that picture, um, is the underboss of the Buffalo Mafia, uh, that he is the first 
Canadian to ever hold an administrative post in a American crime family, allegedly. Uh, on the right is his younger brother, Joe. Uh, they were both, I would say, uh, highly coveted free agents at some point um, in, in the 2000s and 2010s. There was a kind of a fight uh, who was going to claim them as their uh, as their soldiers. Uh, Dom was the first one to go uh, to, to the Buffalo Magadino group. And then I think there was uh, a debate about whether or not Joe was going to go to the Bananos or was going to go into the Magadinos. And he eventually went into the Magadinos. Uh, I believe the, the, the court documents put their makings at like Dom was made in 14, I think, or uh, 14. And then uh, Joe was made in 16. Or maybe yeah, was- and, and traditionally their their fathers and their uncles were members of the Bonanno yeah. family in Montreal. So that's why that, that's why if people are I know it gets confusing, but if they're wondering, well, what do the Bonanos have to do with this? It's because historically their 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 father and their uncles were were members of the Bonanos in yes. Montreal. And from my sources, the Violi brothers right now are in charge of the Buffalo Mafia's cigarette smuggling racket according to the people that i've spoken to and i i'm pretty sure there was a reference in an article uh written about don violi at some point in the last five years that uh alludes to the fact that he was involved in the cigarette uh, smuggling business so if what my people in buffalo are telling me is true the uh the boyfriend and some of the social circle surrounding crystal quinn who is the uh 37 year old stripper that ended up dead uh, in August, who was supposed to be the star witness at this big Buffalo mob racketeering trial, uh, that people that she was hanging around with, including her boyfriend, uh, work for the Violis uh, and work uh, in in the cigarette smuggling racket within the Magadino crime family and work quite heavily on the reservation. Yeah, so it's interesting that this doesn't seem to be like some kind of archaic um, racket, that this is still very much a lucrative. Yeah. Um, uh, and and I guess, with you know, with, it doesn't surprise me with the taxes on cigarettes in, in the United States and in Canada being so high. It, it doesn't surprise me. Um, I mean, I, I don't think we have time to get into it, but there there is another interesting case study. Uh, if people want to look up on their own, Johnny K-9 was um, another wrestling superstar who was one of these guys who was kind of crossed over with the underworld. You know what, Jimmy? Professional wrestling. Let's let's tease this out because I think we should do a whole episode uh, at some point between now, let's say the end of the year, on Johnny K Nine, and we yeah, could, that's we a good could, idea. We could center it around Satan's Choice. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah which is smart. the what, what? Well, it was at one point. Uh, the equivalent of the hell's angels in Canada was Satan's choice. Um, I yeah, believe, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I believe Satan's choice eventually patched over to the hell's angels. Um, I could be wrong. Yeah, I'm not sure, but Johnny Canine is another interesting uh, case study. I think that's smart. Let's hold off on that. And that, that also gives me an opportunity to give a shout out to Grappling with Canada. That's a podcast where they talk about uh, you know the history of, of, of wrestling and, and um, Canadian wrestlers. So Grappling with Canada is a podcast you should check out. And we try to get ha- have um andy on this on this episode but just scheduling conflict so i'll reach out to him again and maybe we'll get him back and then we can do a um just a johnny canine episode because yeah well you're right I'm, you're right that deserves its own kind of discussion and i'm i'm kind of fascinated by biker politics in canada in the 70s and 80s and how it was um related or connected to what was going on in the united states with both the hell's angels and the outlaws growing at you know in a at rapid clips uh, and Satan's Choice was eventually patched over uh, to the Hells Angels. Uh, uh, Bernie the Frog, who I believe was the founder and w- one of the more, more legendary Canadian outlaws of all time. Not outlaws in terms of the right. member of the outlaws right. biker club, but uh, a, a very notorious, iconic criminal in the, in the history of, of Canada uh, was somebody that was being... If my memory serves, and we'll go into this in the episode, Sonny Barger was for years pressuring 
Bernie the Frog to patch over, and he was very nationalistic. Uh, he did not want to patch over to an American a club, and then eventually did. And I think there was some meeting between Bernie and Sonny Barger um, at that point. So, and that's the club that Johnny K9 was was involved in. Yeah, and so, um, and then even shameless self promotion. We just uh, by the time you watch this, our episode on the Banditos Banditos will be available, and, and they their name they come up in that Canadian stuff too so yep. um and it's complicated because you have the different provinces in canada sometimes you're talking about quebec sometimes ontario sometimes british columbia so um yeah Just i like, would uh, I, I would uh yeah let's hold off on that and then we'll do we'll give J johnny canine his own episode i think it's uh, and just as we wrap up just give people a little um update of what's going on in that buffalo racketeering trial um the Prosecutors right now are trying to move the, uh, the, the trial from Buffalo. They're so shook or people that are involved in this case right now. And it's a case that's been percolating for two years um, are worried that more witness intimidation, uh, juror intimidation, possible suspicious deaths are going to happen. Like I said, you've had two people directly tied to this case, a star witness, and then an unindicted co-conspirator who was a New York Supreme court judge. Then you had a third person that ended up uh, dead. We're not positive. It was connected, but it, it, it happened in the hours leading up to the indictment. Um, the indictment got uh, dropped at, at, at like at eight o'clock in the morning at like two o'clock that same morning, uh, this guy that had some ties into some of the Buffalo drug world uh, ended up dying under very strange circumstances at a funeral home that he was the, the, the director of. And then a couple hours later, the first uh, two to drop in this case drops. And, and we should mention this, that uh, sitting at the defense table next to Peter Geraci Jr., at this trial, the nephew of the reputed Don of Buffalo, um, Mafia Don of Buffalo, will be a retired DEA agent, uh, Joe Bongiovanni, who's accused of accepting hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of bribes to protect Buffalo mob drug operations. And he was indicted in bribery at like nine o'clock. I think it was like November 6th. And six hours before that, this guy ends up dead so three you know three uh three people that uh, that are no longer with us uh a lot of them have been looked at as suicides uh two of them have been ruled suicides the one that i just mentioned at the funeral home and then the new york supreme court ju uh, judge was ruled a suicide we, we don't know about crystal quinn uh but the prosecutors want to move the trial from buffalo to rochester and that's being considered by uh, the sitting judge right now. And in their motion to get it moved, they referenced the outlaws, the motorcycle club that the Buffalo mob is most connected to right now uh, as, you know, as a, a lever of uh, uh, that, that can be maybe pulled or utilized uh, by people that, that are sympathetic to Geraci Jr. Uh, they referenced that, some of these outlaws have been seen at trials in Erie County, which is where Buffalo is. Yeah, the Buffalo media reported that, yeah. That, uh, that they do, like, research or recognizance, uh, as well as showing up there for intimidation purposes. So we should see a lot of uh, outlaws, below, uh, a lot of outlaws from Buffalo are employed at Pharaoh's Strip Club, uh, Dracy Jr.'s Strip Club including the, the international president, uh, John Ermine, who goes by the nickname Tommy O. And Tommy O, lat will end on this, Tommy O, the boss of the outlaws, uh, wrote to the judge in this racketeering case, telling the judge that, hey, Peter Tracy's a good guy. You shouldn't keep him without bond. You should give him bond. Mm. <laughs> this is coming from, it's just, I, I guess if, that's, if, that's, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Well, I don't know what the purpose of that really is that that Jeracy Jr. has 
your he, and he's not just an employee at the strip club. He is the manager of the strip club. He, he used to be the head of security. Now he runs the whole club. Yeah. Like Tommy O does. I don't really know what uh, recruiting Tommy O to write a, a letter of sympathy to the judge is really going to do for you. Yeah. That's, that's kind of bizarre, but that's where we are right now with that case. You know, keep on checking with OG pod. We'll, we'll give you some more quick hitters, the more news that comes out of it. And then gangster report, obviously, uh, we, yeah, haven't a, we haven't we haven't identified. Yeah. Of, I mean, even the local Buffalo media is they're really digging in too. I mean, and uh, Bernie, to his credit, has, has broken some of the stories. Uh, he actually published it on Gangster Report before the local Buffalo media um, got to it, but uh, they've been they've been digging in on it too. And uh, I'm not I'm not naming the boyfriend of Crystal Quinn. I know his name. Law enforcement knows his name. Um, I'm not going to name him until his name is put into uh, the public record, either uh, with via an arrest or a, uh, a summons or or a subpoena. But um, we'll we'll keep you updated with him. I, I've heard that at least as of a couple of weeks ago, he was dodging uh, a police interview. He was with Crystal Quinn when she died. Crystal Quinn, we should point out, uh, we know how she died. We don't know if it was a voluntary ingestion of a fentanyl pill or if she succumbed to her previous issues with uh, substance abuse and just took a pill that was laced with fentanyl and died of an accidental overdose. But we know what killed her was what they call an incredible Hulk pill, which is a green Xanax bar laced with fentanyl. We don't know if she took it voluntarily or not, and the FBI is looking into her boyfriend as well as the owner of the house they were at. I can't name him because he's in the press, Simon Gogolak, who right now is um, in custody facing a drug and weapons charge, a uh, drug and weapons indictment. But uh, allegedly, both Gogolak and the boyfriend have some affiliation um, to Buffalo organized crime in the cigarette smuggling business. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, keep checking gangs report, Scott, uh, will report on it. And, um, uh, that's a pretty hot, hot topic now. And, um, and RIP Dino Bravo. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and this was, um, a fun episode and, uh, kind of a, uh, just trying to find my words here because it's, uh, you know, Debbie Downer, Dino Bravo gets killed. Uh, we're talking about suicides and suspicions. <laughs> Incredible to, Hulk fentanyl pills. You know, I'm trying to figure out a way to, to finish this on a lighter note, but I'm I'm struggling. But um, I mean, I'm I'm still a big fan of wrestling. I don't watch it any any longer, but uh, probably up until like the early 2000s, I, I still like to go back and revisit. Uh, but that's why those, you, those, those uh, matches and those uh, storylines. That's why YouTube's so great. I mean, both Jimmy and I, we can sit there for hours and be pulling up old wrestling matches from the eighties. Yeah, it yeah. Just, it can, it can keep my keep my interest for way longer than I'm uh, uh, <laughs> way longer than I want to admit. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, I, I lost interest ar around the early two thousands, but I still I still have uh, a fondness for the everything, but before that. So, well, we appreciate your time and and listening, and and we'll uh, keep on uh, bringing you more content. Please follow us on social media, subscribe to our channel, and we'll talk to you soon. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. I'm Scott Bernstein. We're out. <laughs> <laughs>